Okay, so let's talk a little bit more. So Tom gave us a great introduction to the English turn forest, the forest we're trying to conserve, right? These, these speed bumps for storms that we're trying to buffer our friends in New Orleans and elsewhere by having healthier systems around them. So I want to tell you a little bit more about, and again, we're going to go over all this stuff when we're there, so don't stress out, but I want to make sure you guys have at least exposure to it before we, before we get there. So it's important to say that this is a, a huge, there's, there's, there's many, many more people in this, there's tons of folks, but um, this is a bunch of collaborators from all around that have helped us figure out how to do this. So what I want to tell you guys about is, is the main thing we'll be doing when we're working on our wetland prod, or, or the wetland part of our service when we're in New Orleans. We have a, we had a relatively intact, everything's relative here, but a relatively intact, healthy forest, and then a stress happens. In this case, the stress was Hurricane Katrina coming through. Um, and a uh, huge, huge problem because our friends that are there um, don't have a lot of, especially back in the day, didn't have a lot of resources. So the very first year, the very first trip we took, I took a group of students on, um, we were casting about for who, who needs help. And I was calling animal shelters, see if we can help with animals and this and that. And uh, one very nice lady I talked to said, well, we're, we have a lot of help, but maybe you should talk to this friend of ours who, um, who, who could use some help. And okay, what was up? And and basically, uh, Katie, our friend, our friend Katie Braystead, um, who was managing this one parcel at the time, uh, needed some help. Needed some help to get some additional funding, and said, "I need someone to tell us how bad the invasion is." And so she said, "Can you help with that?" And I said, "I don't know, but sure, we can figure that out." So we literally designed the first sampling protocol on the back of a napkin at a at a at a over dinner, right? I said, we could do this or whatever. And so um, the key thing here is this, the main thing you guys are going to be doing when we're there are doing surveys relative to trails. Why trails? Because trails are the initial source of disturbance for these invasion, invading, invading species. So we use, so we relate everything we do to these trails. So here's the idea. Here we have a trail and um, these guys, historically, in this area and others, were restricted to the disturbed areas. That's the edge. That's the outside of the forest, okay? The area where there's a lot of light and where the dogs go poop and all that kind of stuff, right? So here comes Hurricane Katrina. And unfortunately, it happened at the exact worst possible time for those of us worried about woody invasive species. It happened when all these trees were grown up for the year and they had their tree sex and they made all their tree seeds and their tree seeds were all ripe and sitting there on the tips of their branches. Huge winds come in and they blow these seeds to hell in a handbasket everywhere, all around the area. The seeds are dispersed everywhere. Now, if it was only the seeds blowing into these places, nothing would have probably happened or relatively little would have happened why? Because it's crazy dark. It's a closed canopy. But unfortunately, the storm didn't just blow these seeds around. It also, as Tom showed from the, our, our, previous, uh, our previous discussion, um, a lot of these trees are knocked down. So they're either physically knocked down or they're buzz cut, right? And their canopies are ripped away. So the forest goes, I'll show you a picture in a little bit. The forest goes from being dark at noon to being high light and bright at noon. Now, that means one, these seeds can blow in, but two, now these seeds are exposed to high light. And so these seeds germinate and then we're off to the races. So that's one of the reasons why we use the trails as, as sort of the, the baseline for our surveys. That and <laughs> you, you can just walk on the trails. So sometimes these areas are so thick, it's hard to get through these forests. So all our surveys are relative to trails. So here we go, here's, here's my cartoon trail. And we have these trees, which you guys are gonna enumerate, I'll tell you how we're gonna do this, but as you guys, what you guys are gonna do is you guys are gonna tell us what the species is in an area we delineate. You're gonna tell us how many of those guys there are. And you're gonna tell us 
what's called DBH, which stands for diameter breast height. That means, that means how wide is the woody tree stem at about our chest height, okay? So we're not gonna measure from the ground. Doesn't matter if you're an inch or two up, you'll get it, right? It's just basically put your arm straight out and, and that's the, and Aspen's shorter than Tom, but that's okay, right? We're not, we're, so it's about, it's about chest high, shoulder high, about there, right? Um, and that tells us basically how big the tree is, right? And then lastly, how tall it is, okay? Those are the things we wanna know. So why? We're trying to track the health of this forest. We're trying to figure out if these things we've done in past years, if these management actions we've taken, these restoration actions we've taken, the, the squirting herbicides to try to kill some of these bad guys, if those things are indeed working. That's the goal. So that's why we're counting these things. So here we go. So here's our trail. We have some trees around. And then we have other stuff too. There's sometimes some ferns. There's sometimes some blackberry. And so we also note, looking down from our head to pointing to the ground, approximately how much of the area down below us is blackberry. And again, we're not trying to get to the 14th decimal here. It's like 50%, it's 25%, it's 5%, that kind of thing. Okay, so what the blackberry is like, and then what the fern cover is like. Blackberry is generally indicative of a disturbed area, okay? So if it's dark, super dark underneath and very closed, we generally don't have a lot of blackberry. So blackberry tends to be on the edge of forests. Blackberry tends to be in the area where the trees have fallen down and created a so-called light gap. So, so in a sense, from a healthy, mature forest, a lot of blackberry suggests maybe not doing so well. Conversely, the ferns tell us about also how healthy and what the canopy is like. In areas where we have a lot of shade and a lot of, a lot of blocking of the sun, we tend to have a lot of ferns. Because ferns do better where it's moister and that shaded coolness helps these plants do better. In areas, again, where there, there's no canopy and it's disturbed, that tends to be hotter and drier. That tends to be harder for ferns to live there. So we note those kind of things. We also uh, note how much stuff is on the ground. Okay, we call this leaf litter. And so we're gonna go, come here and check out this leaf litter. We're gonna measure approximately how deep is that. Again, that's gonna tell us about the health of the forest. If we had a bunch of huge giant branches with huge tons of leaves above us, they'd be dropping these leaves and it's sort of like a soft pillow that we're walking on, right? A lot of stuff. If instead it's just hard mud or hard dirt, that tells us there's not a lot of biomass, organic material feeding into the soil. And that's not as good a thing. So another, another indicator of what's going on. So we're gonna measure how, if there is any leaf litter, how deep it is. And then uh, we just fall on logs. So that's another indicator of what's happening to this forest. These, there's always fallen logs in forests. That's part of the ecosystem. That, that, that's important habitat for certain critters, all that good stuff. In this forest though, we're over enriched in fallen logs because these trees have fallen down. So we also track if we have a fallen log, you say yes or no if we have them. And if we have them, we say approximately what the diameter is, sort of, you know, in other words, is it like, is, is it as, uh, is it, you know, a meter wide or is it, you know, a little bit wide? We'll note that and then approximately how long is it? Oh my God, it's a 30 foot piece of a thing or it's just a couple foot long log. So we note these things. Then you guys look straight up above your head. So, so far all that cover I just talked about is as if we're just sitting here and we look down, okay? This next part is, instead of looking down, we're looking straight up, okay? And the idea is, okay, what's the cover above us? You know, how much is bare sky? How much is, is a tree canopy, et cetera? So that's all this stuff. So here's this forest, and you guys are gonna be characterizing the health of this forest, pretty cool. This is how we're gonna do it. Everything is relative to the trails. Everything is relative to the center of the trail. So we're gonna come up and take our transect tape, boom, drop it in the middle of the trail there, and then run that transect tape out into the forest. 
we're always going to go, because I'm right-handed, we're always going to go to the right. So with our butt towards the parking lot from whence we came, right? That's how we're walking, and then we're always going to the right. Years ago when we first started this, we did trail right, trail left, and that got too much work. So we just do trail right. And, uh, and, and so we run that, run that guy out, and that guy's going to go 100 meters out. Straight. As, as straight as we can get it. Straight, you know, boom, out into the, the forest. Now, if it's nice and relatively clear, no problemo. If there's a lot of blackberry, then that's where it gets fun. <laughs> and that's where you guys get to contribute to the people in the world. And help, and really, really leave some of your blood on the, uh, on the trail. <laughs> So, um, so we're gonna lay this guy out, ideally straight. If it's not perfectly straight, no worries. If you thought you heard a snake or something, we're not gonna do that trail, right? We're, we're not doing anything that's gonna endanger anybody or anything crazy. But generally, if it's really thick with blackberry, you'll have one person, and that person will go and sort of blaze a path with the machete. And we'll talk about machete. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna pause my machete discussion for a second but basically so machete in clear little path and then we'll lay that out and then we're going to come survey we're going to, these are these are referred to as band transects so we lay this out and you guys are going to count all the all the woody trees and the cover and all that jazz in a two meter wide band and it'll be up to you guys and your group will be in small groups to decide how you want to do it if you want to run the transect tape out and then go two meters to the right, totally cool. If you want to go one meter to the right, one meter to the left, more power to you. It's, it's however you guys want to do it. But the point is, it's a, it's a two meter swath. And uh, the very edge of the trail, we do a little bit differently. We denote on our data sheet the stop. So where we stop. So normally it's every two meters we go in. So in other words, we're making a two by two meter square. Two by two meter square. Two by two meter square. The very edge of the trail, because things are weird on edges, it's called edge effect. This first one we do zero to one meter, one meter to two, and then by the time at that point we're in the forest, then we just do two meters from there on out. Do you want the transect tape in the middle of the trail or edge of the trail? Or dead, dead middle, dead middle. middle? Okay. So there we go. So there's our, you see my incredible graphic? Let me just show you again. You guys probably Actually. missed it. Look at, oh, oh right two there. meters. What? Snap, right? And so there's a two meter swath we're going to cut through the forest. And this is what your data sheets will look like. Okay, so we're going to print up a gazillion of these, take them with us. We'll probably run out of them and I'll have to go to Kinko's and print up more and that, that's, that's all good. So again, this looks confusing. Don't worry about it. It'll make sense. Until we get there, it's, it's hard to really explain it, but it's pretty easy. Basically, we have this, these, these data sheets and you guys are gonna fill it out. So if we take a quick look right here, uh, uh, I'm just gonna explain it to you. Don't freak out. I'm just gonna run it through so when we see it, it maybe triggers something. So here we go. Sometimes, some of you guys are gonna be on an area that has a gazillion million tr trees every single step. In other cases, it might be totally bare for many meters. So having a giant data sheet that is exactly the same for every single stop is a huge waste of paper. So instead, we have this sort of open format thing, and you guys will adjust it based on what you see. So let's take a look at this. As I said, this is we have a couple different trail names. This one's called Trail A. So you're starting on Trail A. And then every 50 meters, so the very first day, <laughs> Um, I will be out marking things. So I'll be driving around or, or walking around. And we have these areas that have been flagged with flagging tape in years past. And I'll have a, a special GPS and I'll go out and I'll, and I'll remark this. So you guys will have nice, clear, very easy to find areas. And we're essentially going to leapfrog over each other. So we're going as a big group, right? And we're starting out here. So the first team starts here. The next team start at uh, 50 meters. The next one's going to be at 100 meters. The next one's going to be at 150 meters. And what's going to happen is when you guys finish your 50 meters, you're just going to walk down till you get past the farthest group, and you're going to start the next trail. So we're just, we just go, right? And we just kind of go and leapfrog over each other. So here we go. So this group, uh, and you guys will always note your group name and who's in your group on each data sheet. But so here we go. Here's trail A. 
It's the distance is 150 meters from the parking lot or from the start of the trail. It's got the date on it. And then it's transect stop one. And in this case, uh, we had a tallow, which is one of those invasive species. And since then, we, we've done a little bit more standardization of the data sheet since we first started doing them. So, so, so don't worry about it. But this is this this guy here is a red maple, a red maple, a red maple. Check out this tallow was zero dBh. That means that the top of the tree was below my chest, right? It was maybe my well, what was it? It was it was it was three tenths of a meter high. So it was a little dude, right? It's down by my by my thigh, by my knee, kind of thing, right? So that guy doesn't have a DBH because he's too he does, doesn't exist. So this tree was this this diameter and this height. This tree, this red maple, had a one centimeter diameter at my chest and was two and a half meters tall. You guys get the idea? And we just go on down here. And then when I ended it, I drew a squiggly line here just so it was obvious that we're leaving things. In this case, there was, there was one centimeter of leaf litter. There was no wood on the ground. There were no fallen logs. There, you know, and then all these things, uh, exotic canopy overhead, how much ferns, how much blackberry, etc. Then I just draw a squiggly line and I go on to stop number two, etc. So that's, one of, that's what our data sheets look like. Leaf litter, it's just like every... You do, kind of you do. Here, here's two meters, okay. here's four meters, here's six meters, here's eight. Oh, okay, I got you. What I'm also going to give everybody is your own little um, sort of art book that'll be like this, okay? So it's going to be, an, it's gonna be a, a nice paper, heavy paper. You guys are going to get clear uh, sort of like packaging tape. And this is your notebook. So you guys, our default recording device are our data sheets, which we're going to combine at the end of each day. Um, but you should all have your book. Sometimes your data sheets will get ripped or something. You want to make some notes. But especially the first few days as you're learning plants, you use this, right? So the first time we're going there, we're just going to be walking around. You guys will be grabbing stuff. Snap off a leaf. Uh, tape it into your book. So that's what this that's what this uh, guy did. So here's a leaf. It's taped in. Now this isn't like the botanical perfect thing. This is field reference. This is for you guys as you're learning stuff. So so you're gonna jot down what it is and look what this person did. This person said this was at the 200 meters the trail B. So the 200 meter stop. And this this was back back in the day when we were writing all these plants down. You don't have to worry about that. And the other, and then they didn't know what this was. So they called it plant seven. And, and, uh, and so on their data sheet for 200 meters on trail B, they probably had an entry for plant, unknown plant seven. No worries. Because maybe I wasn't nearby, maybe Tom wasn't nearby, maybe John was no worries. As long as we're consistent, and as long as we call this thing plant seven, we're all good. Because then when we come meet up for lunch or at dinner or whatever, we talk to each other, what's this? And then, oh, let me tell you what that is. And then we can go ahead and not totally obliterate, like, you know, let me scratch it out. But it's a one simple line through there. And then we write down what the what the what we now know the correct species name is. And then we can go back to our data sheet and fix it. And that way, there's no stress. You guys don't need to freak out about it. And if you're not sure what it is, call it, you know, group five's unknown one. No worries, right? Then you don't have to panic and spend an hour or two running around. Oh my God, I don't know this. I'm so stupid. I'm not a botanist, whatever. Nah, no worries, right? This also serves as a check. As we come back and we're going through, and we're like, oh my God, nobody had any, I don't know, dogwood. Nobody had any hackberry. Oh, except this one group on this one day, on all their transects, they had hackberry. Nobody else ever saw any hackberry. And so we're looking at the data and we're like, really? I guess it's theoretically possible. And then we can go back to your book. We can flip through it and go, oh, that's not Hackberry. That, you know, they, they, you guys mis, mis, you know, called it something else. So these books will help us. And at the end, we'll collect them just like we will with the data sheets. Um, so so, so that's, that's our approach to, to doing this stuff. Um, what I want to talk about is it, real briefly, though, here is this notion of community ecology. So there's all kinds of critters that come together to form an ecosystem. 
And in this case, this is a salt marsh um, at Magoo Lagoon. And we see if we stare at this, there's all kinds of different canopies. This doesn't look like a big canopy to us because we're big honking people, right? So these, these, you know, these plants are like the height of our ankle, this, this salicornia and this and that. So maybe that we don't appreciate that as much as we should. When we're in a, a nice mature forest, that then we really do see this notion of plant layering and all the interactions of cool species and stuff. So this is what the forest, this is the forest where we'll go to um, look like before Katrina. Some of the parts, you guys will see some of these parts of the forest actually look like this again, or, or starting to look like this again. But check it out, this is noon. Look, it's very dark. We see all these ferns in the foreground. It, that, that's, what, that's a mature bottomland hardwood forest, a mature cypress swamp looks like this. This is what it looked like right after, you know, after Katrina. So you know, still big trees, but the big trees are pretty much stripped of their big branches, and a lot of them have fallen down. And so that's messed up. What we've also continued to monitor over the years here is the continuing the echo of Katrina. So Katrina didn't kill things outright. We'll see this with our human systems as well. Deepwater Horizon killed 11 people immediately, and people say, 11 people died. That's BS. A lot of people died. A lot of people died after, right? They died from the alcoholism. They died from being out of work. They died from abusive relationships. They died, for a, died from a lot of the knock-on effect of this event. And that is absolutely directly attributable to that disaster. Similarly, with our, with our forest, Oh, we go through the forest and, whew, okay, we still have some good trees. We're seeing these trees. We'll, we may, might be getting toward the, toward the end where we're starting to see this basically end. But um, these trees are continuing to die. Why? Because it, when we look like this, look at all those trees. If the wind blew really, really, really hard and I was that middle tree, the fact that I have a bunch of my tree friends around me physically breaks up that wind. And it makes it, there's not as much wind blowing on me. So aerodynamically, I get breaks from my buddies. If all my buddies fall down and I'm still alive, I might survive, but the next big winter storm is gonna be blowing full brunt on my chest and pushing me back and make me more likely to fall down. And then when I fall, I'm gonna fall pretty hard. If I'm like in this mature forest and I, for some reason, start to fall over, I would bonk into my bud and he would sort of hold me up or maybe we would both start to fall and then our friends would. So we'd sort of this, this mesh network of trees would act to keep us all upright. When this is falling up, when this is, when this looks like this, if I start to go over, I'm totally going over and I'm probably gonna fall so hard I'm gonna knock several of you guys down with me. So we're, we, for many, many years after Katrina, we continue to see a lot of tree death. That was again, a direct result of Katrina. It just took several years for for the impact to work its way through the system. So again, this is where uh, we've talked about, this is the English turn, right? So Tom didn't talk about this part of the English turn, but, but um, this, does anybody know where the name comes from? So this was, so this is, um, so check it out. So see the river is like straight below here, and then all of a sudden, whoop, we take a hard turn and we go <coughs> right. Now, back in the day, before motorboats, before engines, we went up rivers like this either by manually pulling up boats with ropes or rowing sometimes, but more typically when we have heavy things like, oh, I don't know, supplies or, oh, I don't know, soldiers, we used sails. So we'd sail up these rivers. But going down was easy. Going down, you didn't need any help, right? The water pushes you down, but going up is hard. And so this was, this was, check out this naturally defensible spot. So it's from a straight, a straight area. So if you're going up, you're going to be using sails. And then you almost, at this point, almost have to turn, stop, drop all your sails, and spin 180 degrees and go, and then go the other direction. So that means in the days of pirates and cannons and stuff, uh, you're going to stop and be vulnerable. So this was, this was a spot where you could go up and there was a, a famous, this happened in a famous time when these guys were trying to turn back these, the, their enemies and they didn't have any way to defend themselves. So they went and cut, they had a few cannons, but they cut down a bunch of trees 
and stuck the trees in the shaded area and made them look like cannons and freaked out the scouts that came up the, that came up the uh, Mississippi. And so the scouts said, ooh, we can't go up there because we'll, we'll, when, we, when we drop our sails to turn, we'll, we'll be completely vulnerable and they'll kill us. So, that, so no battle was fought. So that's why this area is called English Turn. And this is, again, you can see from the satellite images, this is what's called false infrared. And the dark, and the, or the bright green in this picture is all the vegetation. This is one of the last remnant healthy stands of, um, of bottomland hardwood forest. So this area that I'm blowing up, this area over here on the left, that's the woodland trail area that Tom mentioned. This was the original parcel. And you can see with these pink lines, there's a series of trails. It's, it's pretty cool. There's World War II bunkers here. People, there, people ride horses here. There's illegal hunters that we've caught in here. There's all kinds of places. There are not many places that you can easily get to, that you can ride your bike to from the city of New Orleans and go and just be out in, in this forest. So this area where I'm showing you this orange circle, this is right on the border. Remember, we don't have counties in Louisiana. We have parishes. This is right on the parish border between the city of New Orleans, which is called Orleans Parish, and the, the parish that goes down the boot, the, the, the boot tip of the delta called Plaquemines, spelled like Plaque Mines, if you were to spell it out. So we work in primarily for our, our ecological restoration stuff, we work in Plaquemines and Orleans Parish. So that's where we are. And we do a bunch of cool stuff. Um, I'll, Katie will tell you the history of this, but suffice it to say, we're, we're very close to downtown New Orleans. Uh, Dela, the Delacro property is actually in Orleans Parish. Woodlands, that which is where we first started working, is you know, about seven miles from the French Quarter. So very close. Um, it's this bottom end hardwood forest, already mentioned this, cypress forest. Um, uh, basically what happened was people forgot about this. Everybody assumed it was everybody else's land. So no one did much to it. It was, it was lucky in that fashion. <clears throat> so then, uh, actually this thing started. So this, here's the golf course right above us, right here. That golf course went in. This first developer figured out, hey, I can buy this land and start to develop it. So that freaked some people out, including our friend Katie. And they said, oh my God, if we don't do something, this whole area is gonna be plowed under and be converted to, to another development, another housing tract or something like that. So she got, uh, she got together and she, she got her friends and she formed a nonprofit a tax deductible nonprofit, a 501c3 entity that called, and this is confusing, this is what it was originally called, called Woodlands Trail and Park. We, they now changed their name to the Woodlands Conservancy, and it's a lot easier. Because Woodlands Trail and Park, people were confused if we were talking about the NGO or if we were talking about the property. So now, now we, call it, we call it the Woodlands Conservancy. And, uh, and, so, so they, and so this was parish land, and they basically convinced the parish to let them manage it. They'll make it easy for people to walk and do all this good stuff, but just don't chop it down and don't sell it to the developer. And they said, okay. And so Katie took that on. And she's been sort of the queen of this. She has a lot of help, but it really, this really is a case of an environmental hero, a community hero that puts her lifeblood into this and has really made this work through just being dogged and not giving up and going to all these city council meetings and going to all this stuff and going to all these meetings and talking to people and trying to get people to donate stuff day in and day out for years and years and years. Um, and so, so yeah, so that's Woodlands Trail, what we now call Woodlands Conservancy. So as I said, when we came in 2007, they said, hey, can you help us with this? We said, sure. They said, well, we need to know how many of these bad guys there are because we need to get some funding to help get them out of here. And so we said at the time, well, why don't you have some of the local environmental consultants go help? There weren't anybody. There wasn't anybody there. At this time, Tulane University is still thinking they might close. They might not 
reopen fully. A lot of people are still are, have left and haven't come back to New Orleans. They're thinking this place is maybe gonzo, right? The, consultant, the consulting firms that are there are working on these massive oil refinery things and problems and stuff in the Mississippi River, and they, they have bigger fish to fry, right? This is a small nonprofit, kind of out in the boondocks, if you will, and not viewed as important. So let's get the crazy Californians to help us, right? They'll do it because they're from California, right? So okay, let's go do that. So that's how we got involved. And again, the initial idea was just to provide some baseline data going forward. And when we created this class, this class was not designed to be a year to year to year to year thing. This was, hey, we're gonna go help these people out. And so we did this. And then as soon as we finished that, and wrote them a little report the first year, I said, great. So next year when we come back, what we want you to do is, and I said, whoa, 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 what? Next year? Like what? This was a class that I did, right? But so many of our friends said, we need you to come back and help us. But I said, well, okay. And then you guys kept uh, wanting to come. And so it's been this great partnership. But again, it wasn't designed to be this way. It was just designed to be like a one-time show up, help some people do whatever they want. And it's grown into this really uh, useful thing. Um, uh, yeah, so don't worry about that stuff. So here, here are those invasive species. So let me say something. The other thing that we're doing here, we're taking a nerdy scientific approach to this stuff. If all of our efforts fail, that's okay. I don't want them to fail, but that's okay. As long as we know why they failed. And then in the future, we cannot repeat those mistakes. A massive, massive, massive common aspect with a lot of management issues, a lot of restoration projects, is people do not properly monitor. Why? Because monitoring is cleaning the toilets. Monitoring is the boring in and out, all non-sexy, reporters don't come and take pictures of you. It's like, oh my God, it's another day and it's crazy hot and I'm out here again, right? The sexy stuff, the fun stuff, is the donor cutting the ribbon. And look at this thing we're starting, right? Starting the museum is the hot thing. Let's come to the soiree as we open up the museum. It's really boring to be the janitor that cleans out the museum every night, right? But it's probably at least as important as having to have a good janitor as it is to have those donors, right? And so in the case of monitoring, we oftentimes don't monitor. So what happens is something goes on for a while and then it doesn't work. And then people are, oh, dang, that sucks. Okay, that's too bad. Why didn't it work? Oh, no. El Nino. <laughs> really? What, El Nino? Right? So, we believe this is one of our big contributions that we're helping our friends in the area do, and that we're, we're evaluating what's working. So, we have some areas that we've treated and gotten the bad guys out, and importantly, other areas where we haven't done anything, that we've left as a control to look at how bad this has become. And by comparing those two things, we can say very clearly and very concretely if these efforts work. And not only that, we track very, very particularly how much time you guys put into this. And we know how much it costs per unit acre to restore it. And that's important. And you would think that the weirdos from California would be one of a bunch of people that nobody is doing this that one of the national park units near here has treated their, their tallow and stuff. Do they monitor it? Nope. They put a bunch of money into controlling this stuff, but there's no money for monitoring. And this is repeated over and over again. So we, do we want our restoration to fail? No, we want healthy forest. But the only thing worse than not having healthy forest is not learning from our mistakes. That is inexcusable. Spending money, spending time, and not learning from what works just like when we repair homes and communities and install food gardens, let's try it. If it doesn't work, okay, no worries, but let's not repeat that. We, it, the, it's getting too costly. We can't afford to do this with climate change and with our political environment and all this kind of stuff. So that's one of the things you guys are helping with. Okay, let's take a look at you guys. Know this again? Here's, here's our Chinese 
tallow. One of the things when, the, when they're really young, another really helpful diagnostic, you see this teardrop shape, is that the little teeny leaves are a little reddish. And again, we'll know in the first day or so as we're walking around, but that can be a, a really helpful diagnostic uh, tool. This is a little baby, it's a little young one. This is kind of nerdy, but uh, the genus is different than it is now. Oh, that, that's if right. If you look at that, that specimen, that's right. it's got a different genus now. It's mm. triadica. That's right. This is the old slide. Because I just want to say that these names are constantly being reevaluated by botanists and changed. Kind of a. Yes, it's a problem for those of us that are supposed to know the names. Uh, I say, one, one, of the, one of the species I worked on for my PhD has changed its name three times since, you know, and I'm not that, that old. I'm kind of old, but not that old. So anyway, so here, here's, uh, here's another tallow. And so again, when they're little, you can grab them and pull them up by the roots, right? And check that out. So where, basically where her hand is, this is all underground. Look at that root. It's a really, it runs down. Whoa! Go down, get water, right? Where the student on the right is holding, the year before, that plant was basically at her waist. So you can look at this. Look how tall it goes all the way up there. This is this tallow is an incredible plant. But see what I was talking about? Very sort of shoot up, very kind of sh shooty. Not not a big sort of mushroom like tree. It's more of like a aspen, more of like a whoop, like a like a, a pole type of tree, type of growth morphology. Here's China berry. Um, China berry, the stem has this uh, sort of um, uh, white uh, flecking. There's our privet, again, that really sort of uh, a symmetric uh, leaf. Uh, and then it, things can get complicated. So this is one that's been munched or a little bit uh, regrowing. Um, a couple of critters that we have. Um, uh, we have river otters here because we have the, the Mississippi River here. So we do have a lot of otters. Um, otters are super cool. This guy's eating a blue crab. Blue crab are really important part of our estuaries. And you guys might maybe want to eat some of those blue crabs over here. Although most of the group blue crabs that you get if, you are, um, if you're here will be uh, from uh, new, the new, new England area, from the, the East Coast. Uh, we do have snakes. There's a lot of snakes. Short version is if you see a snake, don't worry about it. Right? We have basically... Uh, Western diamondback rattlesnakes that are poisonous. Pretty much all the other snakes we have, not a big deal. Except for the crazy, weird, occasional El Nino deposited sea snake. But basically, nothing nasty, right? We're going to the, almost the tropics, right? We're going to this other part of the country. There are a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of snakes that won't hurt you at all. But there's, um, there's, there's a, a good number of poisonous snakes. So whenever we're, you're in question, you just, nope, no worries. So if you're in the middle of your transect, and I'm like, hurry up, finish your transect, and you get to 25 meters, and you see, Psss, you're like, done with that transect, right? No worries, you just say, hit snake, done. Wheel it up and go on to the next one, right? No need to mess with any snakes ever. Um, this guy is actually not poisonous, he's a, he's a cool green snake. Um, so this is the first snake that the first big snake I saw at um, in Louisiana. So I was laying out the transect tape. So so here I have the transect tape, and in this case I'm not running a transect. I'm laying it out down. I'm figuring out where the stops are for you guys. So I'm actually running the transect down the middle of the trail, not not what you guys uh, would do, right? So I'm running this perpendicular to where your transects are going to go. And I was walking along, and I was got right there, and all of a sudden I heard this. It sounded just like someone had a, had a, um, uh, like an air tank, a scuba tank, and cracked the valve. I was like, what the heck is that? And all of a sudden, oh my god, that's a snake. And I'm looking around, and I'm looking around here, I'm like, where is the snake? And uh, I looked down, and the snake was between my legs. And it's a canebrake rattlesnake, so he's about this thick, and about five feet long. And then I kind of went, you know, like when you kind of feel like you have a heart attack kind of thing, and you're like, ah, oh. and you're like, ah, oh, my chest hurts. And then I was like, ah, oh, right? And so I slowly backed away. And long story short, I took this guy, so he's just off to the side. You can't quite see him when I took this picture, but, but, um, uh, it's too bad you didn't have your rubber boots on. I, I, have my, I have my boots boots on. 
I think he would have gone through the rubber boots. These ones are safer, I think. So, in any event, in any event, right? No harm, no foul. Didn't the guy thought I was going to step on him? Probably was what's going on. So he's like, back the hell up. And I was like, oh, sorry, right? And back up. So, um, so no worries about snakes. We we won't be messing with snakes. We're not going to be uh, uh, drawing them to us or anything like that. And pretty much, you guys tend to make a lot of noise because you're talking, rah, 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 right? And so most of those critters are gonna go whoosh, they're gonna go away from you. They're not gonna like come up and try to eat you or anything like that. So that's actually a good thing. Um, this is our first trip. Uh, I don't think Tom was with us at this point because Tom joined us in Memphis. I've never seen an alligator there. What? No. At Foster's place? Oh, at Foster's place. Thank but you. Not it, not it. So, so this is, this is uh, the first time I, I re I, I'd seen alligators before, but I never really got super close to an alligator. And so we're out looking at this place in the Chafalaya Basin, and we pulled on a, a road that we we're on the wrong road, and it was a wellhead. They're, they're doing oil and gas uh, production. So we started to turn around, and this guy said, hey, you boys lost? And he said, yeah. I was like, okay. And then we started talking, which always happens. And they go, where are you from? I said, like, California. And so we start talking, and somebody, I don't know if it was Cross, somebody said something about, about alligators. He goes, oh, you want to see an alligator? He said, well, is there an alligator? Yeah, I'll show you an alligator. So we get out of the car, and this is a little, a little uh, depression right next to this little pad. He goes, yeah, I'll show you an alligator. So he walks up, and he starts smacking this log with this big stick thing, right? We were saying, what? He's like, hey, you just wait. And we said, I oh, know, that's cool. We don't need, like, no, no, just wait. He's like, smacking, smacking, oh, smacking. Yeah, and then pretty much this alligator starts coming up, and we're like, "Wow, that's great! Let's get out of here!" He's like, "Oh, you want to see it?" We're like, uh, "Well, I think it's okay." He's like, "No, no, we'll see it." And he starts. He's grabbing. You can't really tell. But he's grabbing this tree and sort of hanging out, like smacking the water and stuff. And this alligator's just coming, 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 coming. And then finally, because they can go, you think these things are like, "Wow," and like, you know, I don't want to watch stuff. If they want to go fast, they can actually go faster than you think they could go. And long story short, he's like, oh, it won't come out of the water. It starts to come out of the water. And he's like, oh, I think. And then it starts coming. Like, okay, we should go now. And then we all run back to the car. So that was, that was the first time I saw an alligator. So what I'll say is we've never really had a problem with alligators except for one time. And it was this one guy. So I just want to tell you, just like we, if we see a snake, no worries. We're done. We're, we're not going up there. It's all good. Similarly, if your transect, and this will happen at different points because we have canals and things around. Now, if it's just a rainy time and we're going in a couple feet of, you know, foot of water or something, that, that's different. But this is deep water. You, will, you do not go into deep water. So if we were running the transect out here and we were running, we haven't hit this, right at the edge of the water, we'd stop. We'd stop and say, hey, uh, transect hit the water at 17.5 meters and we stopped. Done. No worries. Go on to the next one. The one time we had some issues with alligators was this one gentleman who was a nice guy, but maybe not the sharpest tool in the shed. And so we're doing something all of a sudden, look, there's, look, there's, there's like an alligator. I'm like, oh yeah, there's alligators. No, no, like alligator like almost bit me. I'm like, what? You know, so run, 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 run back, run, 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 run back. And uh, I'm like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, like what happened? There's an alligator. I'm like, oh man. Oh, that's, that sucks, you know, whatever. And so, okay, fine, go. And then go fast forward about three hours, I don't remember, three, four hours, some, some amount of time later. And I was like, the rest of the rest is alligator. Like, what? <laughs> and so this guy was like, I want to go in the water. And he, and he kept, he, I don't know if he just wasn't, didn't have a memory or what the deal was. But, but we ne nobody has ever, ever had any problems with alligators except for this one guy who seemed to attract alligators every, everywhere he went. So maybe he smelled good or whatever. But again, um, we're just gonna, not going to have a problem because we're not going to go in the water, so it's all good. Uh, again, everybody worries about the snakes and the alligators. This blackberry is going to be much more problematic for you than any of those other things. And this is ubiquitous, and so we've got to deal with it. Uh, let's talk about proper, I have a video I'll share with you guys tonight, I want you guys to watch proper machete. So I, I hurt my, I broke my wrist visiting John, I'll tell you the whole story later. 
But um, uh, I, I was cursing risk management. People say risk management. People are stupid. And then I fell and broke my wrist. So I got you know karmic balance back into my life or something. So uh, so I had I have I have a I have a screw in my wrist now. Um, and so uh, when I was getting when I was recovering, which was about two years ago, um, my physical therapist was helping me, and I said, "Hey, can you tell me proper machete technique?" <laughs> and so she said, "What do you mean proper machete technique?" And so I explained. At first, I said, "Is it okay for me to with my wrist that was just fixed?" And I used it. Like, yeah, sure. So we did a quick video in her therapist's office for how to use a machete. So I'll show you guys. But the short version is this. Now, this is one of our key tools. Key thing is we want it sharp. Okay, sharp, sharp, sharp machete. Now this is what happens. Thank God we have a lot of ladies this year. That's great because the guys always want to do lightsabers with <laughs> with these machetes, and so like oh swashbucklers. And so so the idea is we're gonna be sharp. They're gonna be sharp. And again, we'll explain all this when we're, when we're there in the field. But the idea, what you want to do is you want to, if my arm is a thing I want to cut, some a blackberry stem, what I want to do is I want to hit it at 45 degree angle. Right? If I hit it from the side, my hand is just, the stem is just going to flop to the side. If I go too much up and down, it's just going to skim along and, and not really do anything. So 45 degree angle is like the best. Right? Um, the next thing is uh, not like so hard I'm giving myself blisters, but I want a solid wrist. Okay? So the swinging is my shoulder and maybe my bicep. That's, that's how I'm cutting this. I'm not doing this. I'm not flicking my wrist. Flicking my wrist is how I'm going to get, you know, strain my wrist and get a, get a sore wrist. And this is always solid. So it's, it's I step, right? I step with my foot, and, and it's the weight, ching, that's how I cut. You do not need, depending on the year, you probably won't need to cut very much. So we have the machete as like an occasional, whoop, let's get that guy out of the way. Oh, that might hit her in the head. Let me just cut that out of the way, that kind of a thing, right? When you're laying out the transect tape, it's okay if it's not 100% the straightest line you've ever seen in your life. It's okay if it goes a little, you know, half foot that way and a foot that way, right? That's okay. That's okay. Um, that's actually probably better because it's faster to do that. Um, also, it's usually a dude thing, but what we invariably have is someone that's, okay, I'm going to do the machete, and then they make a carved, uh, you know, excavated, uh, you know, pat mine shaft through the, through, every single thing is cut, and it's like a perfect, you know, like English, English, yeah, tunnel, and it's like, what? And so don't need to do that. Don't need to do that, right? Um, one, because you're cutting up a bunch of plants and wasting a bunch of energy, but also, you know, it's just, it's, you, you're going to get super tired, and you're going to do that for about five minutes, and go, tell me how's my trade with me, right? So it's best to, you guys are probably find your rhythm. When, after the first day, you kind of learn it. But after the first day, you kind of find your rhythm. And one of you guys might be really good at note taking. And one of you guys might be really good at identifying the plants. And one of you guys might be this or that. But it's important, and you can have your roles. It's important, though, to whoever is doing the cutting that you spell him or her fairly frequently. Because it's really easy to get tired. And tired is when you're going to get hurt. So the first couple times I show you this, you guys will be paranoid at this sharp thing, and it's going to be a what, and then you're going to cut the first thing, and you're like, this is freaking awesome, I want to go cut some things, right? So that first little bit, you're going to be, yeah, you're going to be adrenaline, it's awesome, and I'll be saying, be careful, right? And so you're going to look behind you, make sure nobody's around you when you're cutting and all this and that, and then what's going to happen is you're going to get cocky. Okay, good, I can do this, and, then rah, rah. and that's where you start to, whoa, what, and your hand starts to get a little limp, and that's, and so those, that's the danger part. The danger part is after you get a little bit comfortable with this stuff and you forget some of our safety procedures in the, in the most effective ergonomic thing. Yeah, Jake. Um, are we gonna have sharpening stones out yes. there to maintain? Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. 